Uh, Madam President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, it's some. Um, I was going to say it's a pleasure to be here. I was actually born and bred in Birmingham, although I've only lived here for a few years, so it's rather fun to be back. But that said, about a week ago, I did think, why exactly am I coming here to talk to you? Um, and I was a serving soldier for 40 years. Uh, apparently, I'm a veteran. I don't like that phrase very much. It makes me feel rather ancient. Um, but I'm not sure I really fit in. I now run a, a national charity. I sit on many other military charity boards. Um, what can I contribute? Uh, so I had a nervous moment on that, and then I had an even more nervous moment because I thought after 25 minutes you might ask yourselves the same question. Why was he here? Uh, on a more positive note, I love this clock which tells me I've got 25 minutes to talk and I must finish at 0944 hours, which is excellent. Um, why am I here? Well, actually having reflected, once I got over my nervous moment after a stiff coffee or whatever, um, it struck me that, of course, um, if I've got it right, your mission is to serve others. In fact, I think your motto is service above self. Well, when I was a young officer and I left Sandhurst a long time ago, uh, then and still today, you're given a red book. Uh, we used to rather rudely call it Chairman Mao's little red book but it's entitled uh, Serve to Lead. And the language in this booklet, which is still issued to young officers today, would absolutely resonate with anybody in this audience. Serve to Lead, it's a fantastic title. And of course, when you think about it, fundamentally, military life uh, is a contract where you put the needs of the nation and your comrades um, above your own, even potentially at the uh, risk of loss of life, it's a sort of rotary plus contract, if I could put it that way. <laughs> I mean, what I want to do this morning is just say a little bit about an example where your organization and my organization and others have worked together uh, for something I think is really interesting and, and I hope worthwhile and, and I, I hope you find it interesting. I need to just turn the clock back slightly uh, for us in the military, and in my case in, in the military charities, 2014 does resonate, obviously, because of the 100th anniversary of the outset of uh, World War I. Um, and we obviously relate to that and how we care for people today who get into difficulty. And it's fascinating to see how this issue has developed over the years. And if you go back 100 years ago, uh, a time of desperate casualties, destitute families, a period when the state, frankly, did very little to help individuals who were uh, maimed or otherwise uh, damaged. Uh, a period when some of the well-known military charities were formed, in particular the British Legion. If you come forward to the Second World War, um, this period resonates for my own charity because the army decided in 1944 they were not going to make the same mistake again. Um, and rely on the state and, and, and those well-established charities, they were going to set up their own national charity, uh, and out of that we were born. But you know, in truth, not much has changed until even the 1980s. And I was listening to Radio 4 last month, and a very heroic uh, soldier called Simon Weston, which is a name that may be known to some of you, was talking about his experiences in the Falklands War. He was probably the most grievously wounded uh, soldier to survive. And I found it very thought-provoking because he was reminding us that even in the 1980s, if you died in enemy action, you were effectively buried where you fell. If you go to San Carlos today in the Falkland Islands, it's just like going to any other Commonwealth war graves uh, site. Uh, if you were wounded, you received, frankly, pretty rudimentary medical treatment, uh, in that case in a deserted barn. Uh, and, and for him, a long sea voyage back to the UK, uh, more treatment, a handshake, a wish of good luck, and then you get on with your lives, for better or worse. And what is fascinating is that in 1982, soldiers expected nothing more, and I think it's fair to say that society felt that little more was necessary. Well, we live in a very different world today, uh, and I think it's a better world, but it is different. Society's expectations have been completely recalibrated in the context of this sort of uh, event. And social media has a big part to play in that. 
Our dead are invariably repatriated. I still find it astonishing to imagine that's only really started happening since the 1990s. And most of you will have seen the searing images of coffins being taken back through Royal Wooden Bassett uh, from recent conflicts. I have to say those are scenes that professional soldiers are profoundly uncomfortable with uh, for a variety of reasons. The culture of a stiff upper lip is still pretty prevalent in people of my background. But there's a much more important change that's happened over the last uh, 15 or so years. Uh, and that is the extent to which young servicemen and women who receive injuries in conflict are surviving those injuries to an extent that never happened before. I was at a briefing uh, about a month ago uh, where I was talking to one of the most senior military surgeons from the Queen Elizabeth II Hospital, which is where we treat our people. It's just down the road from here. It's the most fantastic facility if any of you have uh, had the privilege to, to, to go there. Uh, but he was talking, and also um, in the same conversation was a senior consultant from Headley Court, which is another amazing organization where we put broken bodies back together again. And the point they were making to us was that even five years ago, certainly ten years ago, if you lost a limb in conflict, it was clearly a serious injury, and if you lost more than one limb, uh, it was probably going to be fatal. We're in a very different place now. I mean, to be quite blunt, if you lose a lower leg or lower arm injury through amputation, it might be described as a trivial wound. In fact, your friends might, this might say you've just had a scratch, and I'm really not exaggerating. There are now young people, and some of them not so young, who are surviving the loss of three or more limbs and many other injuries. And this is a fantastic tribute to modern medical science. And I have to say, if you ever get mown over by a bus, try and find a military surgeon rather than a civilian one, and I don't mean that rudely. <laughs> the key point, though, about this, and I think we had not perhaps realized it at the start, is that not only are these youngsters uh, surviving these amazing injuries, but they're expecting, in fact, they're demanding to live a fulfilled and exciting life quite possibly into their 80s or 90s. They are not going to sit around in their wheelchairs or hobbling just down to the local shops on the walking stick. They want to live life to the full. Now, expectation is one thing, but the challenge, of course, for the military, for charities like myself, for society at large, and by extension, actually, the Rotary, to some extent, is how do we actually make this happen? Frankly, it took my uh, community some time to understand the extent to which the goalposts had shifted in this regard. But over time, the Ministry of Defence established what rather dryly was known as the Defence Recovery Capability. But these are regional hubs, uh, 13 of them around the country, and they act as a halfway house between uh, hospital and Headley Court and either return to duty, hopefully for many, or discharge out into civilian life. They're mainly funded by the Ministry of Defence and government at large, but charities are an important part, uh, with the Legion and Help for Heroes initially in the lead, but other major military charities, including my own, now very much heavily involved. In fact, it's our single biggest area of commitment for my charity. When we set up collectively these centres, uh, to be honest, it was slightly, you know, we'll see how we go, and we learnt as we went along, because it was new ground, this, actually. But one of the early judgments that were made, and I think quite rightly, is that they should not only care for those who were wounded, and there are a number of reasons for that. The first was, and this is not well understood by many people, thankfully, the number of wounded, even in the worst years of Iraq and Afghanistan, are very small indeed, thankfully. This is not understood, as I say, uh, and indeed is not the picture painted by some charities, which is perhaps regrettable in some regards. I don't mean for a moment to undermine the priority and the importance of care for these individuals, but the fact is there are about 3 or 5% of the total load military charities collectively deal with, and thank heavens for that. The reality is that far more soldiers, and this has always been the case actually, uh, are damaged through training, through taking unnecessary risks, and just the fact that 
The armed forces effectively self-select risk-takers, and then we train them to be even more risk-taking, uh, and I'm afraid then things sometimes go wrong. But the other reality that uh, lay behind this decision was an understanding that quite often the difficulties these young men and women face can be more insidious than a major injury or something that's just pretty obvious to look at. And so, um, we, I mean, if I look at the cases I deal with an average year, uh, and we handle around 14,000 cases of need in an average year across the army community, uh, it's very sobering, very sobering indeed, how slim the margin is between a full and sensible life and cataclysmic tragedy, even for the most robust individual, uh, strongest family, even the wealthiest family. We all live life slightly by a thread, and many don't understand that. And what can happen, particularly tragically, tragically for some of these service families, is uh, they've escaped sometimes, not always by any means, but sometimes quite impoverished lives, perhaps coming from very disadvantaged backgrounds. It's still a traditional route out of those backgrounds for some. And they've made good in the armed forces. But then either through injury or other difficulty, they find that career, which is not just a job, but it's a vocation, is terminated, and they have to fall back into the backgrounds from whence they came. And I thought it was interesting to see that um, an ex-Labour minister, Alan Milburn, who recently produced an uh, independent report on social mobility, commented that not only did the armed forces run the single biggest apprenticeship in the country, if not in Europe, but it was also an exemplar of social mobility, which is not always something that you might appreciate when you look into what can appear as a traditional and hierarchical organization. But if you come from a difficult background and you're discharged, then you can all too easily revert back into an impoverished existence. And that is a tragedy for those individuals, but it's actually a tragedy for society at large. Where do you fit in? Where could you fit in as an organization and as individuals? Well, in the northeast of England, um, we have one of these recovery hubs. And it's located at Catterick, which is the second biggest army garrison in the United Kingdom. Uh, but in this hub, they care for soldiers, sailors, and airmen who fall into these difficult circumstances, whatever the cause. And my own charity is very heavily involved with all these uh, recovery hubs. But in Catrick in particular, uh, we developed a relationship with District uh, 1040. And I didn't know anything about Rotary uh, in, in advance, or very little anyway. Um, but it's been an astonishing story how this relationship has developed. Some of you, I'm sure, from that district will be here today. When we started with the relationship, I have to say from the charity's perspective, um, bluntly, we're interested in your ability to provide some funding support. And of course, that's very gratefully received. But we quickly realized that actually that was not the issue. Uh, what was the issue was this astonishing resource of skills and experience Rotarians have, uh, your links to the community, and your ability, therefore, to help youngsters who are going through a very difficult period in their life. We jointly set up a program called The, called the Brighter Future, uh, and the aim was to exploit uh, your uh, expertise and background uh, and complement the work of the Ministry of Defence, uh, the Army, in my case, uh, and the other military charities. And what you've been doing and I think it is a wonderful story, is providing uh, servicemen and women with the tools to transition back into civilian life, is, if that is what is required. And the sort of things that have been going on up there are to provide advice on the world of work, which can be a very terrifying prospect for an individual who has effectively gone straight from school into a very ordered, closed society, effectively, where to a large extent uh, you're looked after uh, and your life is, is really controlled to some, to some degree. So, the world of work, budgets, 
and military you don't deal with budgets a great deal sometimes, business plans, interview skills, and all the stuff you need to survive in the outside world. Putting a human face on the courses that are run by the Ministry of Defence and others, bringing them to the life, linking it to the local community in the region. And one of the things I find most interesting about this is the extent to which young men and women leaving the armed forces go on to set up their own businesses. They have the drive, they have the commitment, they have the skills, and they flourish. And if I'm really honest, uh, um, as, as a senior officer, uh, I rather assume this was the sort of thing that officers did. Quite the contrary. There are many soldiers, privates and upwards, who've set up businesses, and gosh, they're going well. Inevitably, there's more that could be done. Um, and if you want to help, well, then that's great. Why should you care? Well, one of the things that is not well understood uh, in this country is that at any one time, around 10% of the population are either young men and women waiting to join the armed forces, they're serving the armed forces, they have served in the armed forces, like myself, or they're the next of kin of those who are doing so. 10%. It's a huge community spread right across the nation. So there's lots of opportunities to interact with people uh, who fall into this category. Sometimes there's a public perception that the typical serviceman is a sort of bayonet-wielding maniac. Um, and that's only the men. Um, they're sort of people you, you could make good use of on a dark night, although I'm sure this evening with, I think it's the Back to the Beatles tributes, you probably won't want them around. <laughs> of course, the reality is most of them are not like that. They're skilled and highly motivated individuals with a real sense of vocational commitment. And of course, the state has put a tremendous investment into their training and further development. So if you think of the typical serviceman and woman, you shouldn't be thinking of a squaddy. You should think of someone who's a nuclear engineer technician, an avionics engineer, a logistician, rather than my bayonet-wielding maniac. Their lives, as I have described, can be tragically changed by circumstance, whether it's wounding on operations or something else. Uh, and one of the particular difficulties some of them face is having lived a life of moving around with their families, perhaps having severed the link to their communities where they came from, it can be a very daunting thing to suddenly find you've got to go back to it. The state does much to help, and so they should, and they're complemented, of course, by the military charities of which I am a representative. And by the way, just as an aside, there are far too many military charities, and if I could cull some of them, I would. But we do work extremely closely together, particularly the big ones. So, um, you know, we coordinate in a sensible way. But despite the work of the government and the state at large, despite the work by the charities like my own, uh, the fact is, in the final analysis, it's society that has got to help these people. Otherwise, we're not going to get su successful outcomes as they move back into the community. And there's certainly far too large a body of people uh, to waste. These people are in your community, right across the UK, and where appropriate, they would help. Uh, they very much welcome your advice, and you are a unique resource that can actually deliver it. If you're looking for opportunities to do things in the community, this is an offer on the plate. These are vocational opportunities that are ready-made, they're relatively low impact from your perspective, but they have a fantastic output if you feel it would be appropriate. On behalf of all of those I help, and my sector collectively helps, I would very much like to um, formally thank the members of District uh, 1040 and many others from the Rotary Movement who've done so much uh, in this area. If you want further details, if you're interested in the idea, um, we have a team back with one of the stands, but I do commend it to you. As I say, I'm very grateful. It's thought-provoking stuff, and thank you for the opportunity to say a little bit about it.